Well, I want to welcome you to the second of our State of Democracy lectures this year. I'm Grant Reher, director of the Campbell Public Affairs Institute, and we're very excited and honored to be co-hosting this talk by former Vermont Governor Madeline Kunin. And in this endeavor, we're being joined by the Greater Syracuse Chapter of the National Organization for Women. And in particular, I want to thank Karen DeCrow and Mena Buck for helping to bring the governor here uh, to us tonight. Uh, before I say a bit more about Governor Kunin, I'd like to also thank the Dean's Office for its support of the series and for technical support. I want to thank Tom Fazio and the Information and Computing Technology Group, and also Bethany Wallowender and Kelly Coleman, who work in the Campbell Public Affairs Institute and help to put these uh, talks together. Uh, let me just say a few words about how we'll proceed. We'll hear first from Governor Kunin. And then we'll have two brief responses from my Campbell Institute and political science colleagues, Christy Anderson and Sarah Prally. After that, we ask you to join into the conversation and we'll take your questions and brief comments. And when we do that, um, please wait for the microphone to be passed to you so that you'll be part of our archive and also our live streaming. And I also would ask that after you have uh, stated your question or made your comment that you give the microphone back to the person uh, who's waiting to get it from you. Um, then what we'll do is we'll repair to the foyer for a very nice reception where there is food and drink and where the governor can sign a book for you uh, if you like. Now uh, before I say a few words about Madeline Kunin, let me just make one other important announcement and that is to ask you to please silence your ringing devices at this time if you already haven't done so. <laughs> Someone's listening. That's good. Otherwise, you'd be being rude to yourself when you were talking. <laughs> so now, now to say a few words about Governor Kunin. Madeline Kunin served as governor of Vermont from 1985 to 1991. She was the first woman elected to that office, and she is the first woman in the United States to be elected governor for three successive terms. Following her service as governor, she served as Deputy Secretary of Education and as the United States Ambassador to Switzerland. Currently, she is Marsh Scholar Professor at Large at the University of Vermont. She's the author of several books, including The New Feminist Agenda, which she'll be speaking from tonight, as well as Pearls, Politics, and Power, How Women Can Win and Lead. The new feminist agenda has been widely praised from people such as Bill Clinton uh, and Joan Blades, the founder of Move On. Former Labor Secretary Robert Reich wrote this about the book. Women's social and economic gains over the past 30 years have been staggering, but equally staggering is how little America has changed in response. What's needed is a new feminist agenda to bring the country up to date. Madeleine Kunin, one of the nation's foremost leaders, has stepped up to the plate and delivered us a home run. Well, Governor Kunin, we're delighted to welcome you to the Maxwell School's batter's box, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm not shocked by the snow. <laughs> uh, it fully meets my expectations. Uh, having listened to weather reports for years about the snow belt, and of course coming from Vermont. So uh, thank you for inviting me here, and thank Karen. Uh, we go way back to the 60s and 70s, as we were reminiscing a bit now, when Karen was president of NOW, and uh, we're still here, and we're still fighting some of the same battles. It's interesting that this is the uh, year of the 50th anniversary of the feminist mystique, and that's what got some of us started. Um, it was a real wake-up call for many women of my generation, and uh, we really started thinking differently. But it started out with controversy, just as feminism and the word feminist is somewhat controversial today. I remember I belonged to a book group then in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we 
took up the feminist mystique. And uh, they met in my living room that night. And the living room just broke up into two sides. Um, it was as if, you know, a baby gate, that's what we talked about then, uh, had divided the room, or if it was Democrats on one side and Republicans on the other. And the two different viewpoints were one group said, this is outrageous what she's saying. You know, she's attacking me as a mother, she's attacking me as a spouse. And they felt sort of personally very vulnerable by Betty Friedan. The other half, and I guess you can guess which half I belong to, <laughs> said, wow, at last, somebody's saying what I have been thinking and wishing for, a sense of restlessness, a sense of dissatisfaction with the status quo. How are we going to live our lives? How are we going to take care of our children? How are we going to be providers? And it was all a big puzzle. The interesting thing is, much of it is still a big puzzle in terms of how can you be a wage earner and a caregiver? And this is a question not only reserved for women, it is one that many men are asking as well. But, you know, in those early days, feminism was considered a fairly, having a fairly narrow constituency. And it was also considered to be somewhat self-centered, you know, liberation. We want to be free uh, to do our thing. What Betty Friedan didn't realize and couldn't have in her time, and what I didn't realize, and I suspect Karen didn't realize, is today feminism is completely transformed into something much larger. It is not exclusively for women who identify as feminists. It's not exclusively for women who do not identify themselves as feminists. It is for men. Why? Because the whole concept of gender equality, which is my definition of feminism, is fundamental to political stability and economic growth. Today, it is really an economic and political question. Because there is now, in the year 2013, overwhelming evidence that the countries who provide the most substantial level of gender equality also have the greatest growth in GDP and the greatest political stability. And those who keep women down are handicapped. And they're not only attacking women, they are shooting themselves in the foot by really censoring their own opportunity, not only for women, but for everyone. So, you know, if you, there, I'm sure you've heard many definitions of democracy here at the Maxwell School. And I think it's great, and I thank the people who have sponsored this lecture series, because you know, like feminism, democracy has many definitions as well. The most simple one, which I just heard the other day, is that you have a leader elected by the people and that you have a transition, of a, a peaceful transition of leadership. That is kind of the fundamental architecture of a democratic system. But when you get a little further down, democracies also when they are successful, protect the most vulnerable in society, protect, protect minorities, and provide equal opportunity based on gender and other issues that may distinguish them from, from the mainstream, if you want to call it that. Again, fast forward a little bit. If we look at the parts of the world that have experienced the most recent invisible upheaval, like the Middle East, where there is a big debate whether these countries can, in fact, become democratic in the basic sense of the word. One of the big debates going on, as it is in Egypt 
and surrounding countries is about the role of Islam and the condition of women. And the centerpiece of debate is what will be the role of women in society? Will they have access to education? Will they be able to enter the workplace? Um, so this, this is no longer within the confines of what we had thought of as feminism. This is now in a much broader context. But the central question is still the same. How much gender equality can a society guarantee? So it is not simply self-fulfillment for women. It is the fulfillment of a society's desire for growth, stability, and prosperity. Now, I was ambassador to Switzerland from 96 to 99. And in that role, I had the opportunity to participate in the World Economic Forum, which is held in Davos, Switzerland. And the, uh, it's a, most of you have probably read bits and pieces of it here and there. It's where political leaders and economic leaders hobnob, make deals behind the scenes, and are there to be seen and to listen and learn something new. But it's considered the apex of power for some. Well, when I was there, in those years, there were very few women. Sometimes I got excited about seeing women there, and it turned out they were fur-clad spouses or partners. And so women were not actors uh, at these events. They were bystanders. But more recently, the World Economic Forum has put out a gender gap index. They evaluate countries for the level of gender equality. They don't do that because there's a new streak of feminism. They do that because of the relationship between economics and gender equality. They measure such things as, in four categories, economic participation, education levels, political, political participation, and health. Strangely or unfortunately, however you look at it, the United States actually ranks 19th in our level of gender equality according to that gender index. The best countries, in case you want to move, are <laughs> Iceland is number one, Finland, Norway, Sweden, not a surprise that the northern countries are the most advanced in this area. Klaus Schwab, who was the brainchild who founded the World Economic Forum, has recently said that a low gender gap is directly correlated. I'm saying this backwards. A good gen yeah, it is a low gender gap. A low gender gap is directly correlated to high economic competitiveness. So it's, we've leapt forward in our attitude towards these issues in a very significant way. But why is the United States low? Uh, there are a number of reasons. One, we do not have the same work, family policies that the rest of the world has. Um, I'm not just talking about developed countries. I'm talking also about emerging markets and developing countries. Let me give you an example. The United States is one of three countries that has no law requiring paid maternity leave. We have unpaid maternity leave, FMLA, the Family and Medical Leave Act, which guarantees three months of unpaid leave after the birth of a child uh, and some other medical leave. Uh, but all is unpaid. It's unpaid because of the art of compromise to get the bill passed. But 
Unpaid leave is rare. Um, the, our cohorts in this category are Swaziland and Papua New Guinea. So it is bizarre company that we keep when it comes to paid maternity leave. Why is paid maternity leave important? Well, picture a new parent, and you've just had a baby, and you have this Hobson's choice, whether to go right back to work so you can keep your paycheck, or whether to stay home and bond with this newborn, which we know with increasing importance is so significant in an infant's development, and give up that paycheck. Well, any family knows that the birth of a baby, the bills don't disappear, they mount. And it is the worst time in the world to give up a paycheck. That's just one example. So my, you know, to catch up with the rest of the world, we will have to figure out how to put some of these policies in place. And on my list, the four most important ones are paid family and medical leave, which would not only help young families, it would help the elderly. Uh, you know, if, if, if grandma gets sick, uh, you can take her to the doctor under FMLA. Uh, if uh, you have a handicapped child who needs help, you could take leave for a family emergency without losing your job. One thing the existing law does, though not everybody obeys it, says you can't be fired for taking leave. Having said that, however, there's still a, so, a kind of opprobrium, a kind of questionable attitude in many workplaces, even if you take the leave that you are allowed to take. Are you really that ambitious if you take three months off? Uh, would you be up for promotion? And this often works hard on men as well as women. Uh, but increasingly, a younger generation of men does not want to be like the generation of bad men. They want to be there to kiss a child goodnight, read a bedtime story, and be a real dad and also ideally share in the responsibilities of caregiving. So paid family medical leave. Related to that is workplace flexibility. Um, this seems to be the number one request from working families. And as we know, 80% of families today have two wage earners. You know, the old Norman Rockwell portrait of mom in a pinafore, stirring batter endlessly, and dad in a suit with a briefcase walking out the door, and two perfect children were waving him goodbye. That's passe, for those of you who remember Norman Rockwell. If you don't, Google him. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, it was an ideal portrait, and it probably wasn't as ideal then as we look back on it now. But nevertheless, today, both mom and dad in most families walk out the door and figure out who's going to pick up the child from childcare uh, in time. So workplace flexibility which can mean a lot of things. It can mean saying, I want to work four days instead of five after having had a baby. It means I want to be able to pick up my child uh, from childcare. It may mean I want to work from home uh, two days a week. Uh, but the, the key is flexibility, that you don't always have to be there with FaceTime um, from nine to five. The family has changed, but the workplace has been frozen in place. The workplace still functions as if somebody were at home is if somebody were at home to feed the dog, to take care of the children, to be there when somebody is sick, and to have dinner perfectly 
made on time and presented beautifully. But with a martini, I assume. But uh, do you all know what martinis are? <laughs> but uh, those were those days. So flexibility is important uh, to accommodate the needs of contemporary families. So we have paid family and medical leave, workplace flexibility, and the third one is affordable quality childcare. We also know much more now than we used to about early childhood education. Uh, neuroscience tells us how the brain develops even before birth uh, in infants. And not only does the brain develop in terms of capacity to do reading and math and whatever, the brain develops emotionally in the first thousand days of an infant's life. And good care, loving care, which parents can give, and if they can't give, good child care can give, is critical to a child's development. Now, some will say, you know, we can't do this in America. Uh, we can't be like France. And France, for example, has national child care system, where 95% of French families participate. Why? It's not that they just want to you know, drop off their kids and have a steak and frite and a good glass of wine, but because the child care system is so good. It's high quality. It trained teachers like regular school teachers and everybody uses it, and it can start at the age of three. President Obama is proposing early childhood education in preschool. Some states are beginning to do that. One, surprisingly, is Oklahoma. So it isn't necessarily a liberal conservative issue. Can we afford it? Well, my argument would be we can't not afford it. We do know how to do it because one sector of our government has the best childcare, and it is run by the United States Secretary of Defense. The military has affordable, quality childcare available on the sliding scale. All of its centers are certified, very hard to get national certification. Why? Well, you can figure it out. It's considered a question of national security. You can't keep people in the military if you can't provide for their children. Just as a footnote, the military also has the best education system in the country from K through 12. And that is partly because when the Secretary of Defense or his <coughs> representative goes before a congressional committee, he gets what he asks for because he can say this is national defense. Well, I suggest to you, having children grow up healthy and loved is also a question of national security. And I'll get back to that in a moment. I already mentioned paid sick days. Because um, it's also a health issue paid sick days. We're debating that in Vermont right now. And the governor of Connecticut uh, campaigned two years ago on the issue of paid sick days. And it was a winning issue. It was a winning issue. And his theme was, I don't want somebody to sneeze into my salad. If <laughs> the compromise was, it, was only, it only applies to service workers. But service workers are the most vulnerable. You know, if you're in a management position or you're in a top level position, you can usually negotiate this. You know, I'm gonna take a couple of days off. Is that all right? I'll make it up next week or later in the year. Because you have the power to negotiate. But the middle income or the low income wage earner is powerless when it comes to these issues. Well, why are we behind and why is it so hard to pass legislation? 
I understand you're going to hear from Kirsten Gillibrand uh, in, in January. And she can tell you some of the battles that she's been forging in the Congress. Well, like in many issues, because the Congress seems, not only seems, is dysfunctional, um, some things are happening at the state level. Uh, actually, California and New Jersey have paid family and medical leave. They have a tax that the employees pay, not the employer. It's like a social security. It's a uh, disability tax is how they fund it. Um, in some cities, you had an interesting experience down the road from you in New York City just before the mayoral campaign. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg and Christine Quinn, the president of the New York City Council, were opposed to paid sick days. They said it was bad for business and Wall Street was breathing down their neck. Um, then something happened shortly before the election. It didn't turn out to be the magic pill they would hope, have hoped, but Christine Quinn changed her mind about paid leave, and suddenly she supported it. Why did she support it? Well, she was nervous about the election, but she also realized that there's a constituency out there that can be more powerful than the opponents. The opponents are traditionally, at every state, with every family-friendly issue, big business, personified by one of the biggest lobbyists, the United States Chamber of Commerce. But there are other businesses which are less doctrinaire and are beginning to recognize, hey, this may be good for business. We may be able to attract and retain talented employees if we provide them with workplace flexibility. I'll give you an example. A neighbor of mine runs an energy company in Vermont, and she was talking with a colleague of hers who also is a CEO. And the colleague was saying, you know, every time a woman gets pregnant, she quits. And Beth said, that's not my experience. Every time a woman gets pregnant, she returns. Beth talks to the employees, works out a way to keep her, keep her talent. And whether it's flexibility, whether it's different hours, whatever, she works with the employee. And why does she go to this trouble? Because it costs her a fortune to retrain somebody else cost five times the salary, according to studies, to retrain a person. And that is not only applied to the most skilled workers, it also applies to those who are in the service industry. Why? Because today, a good worker is one who shows up on time. A good worker has a good attitude. So it is more than you know, STEM skills. It is the workplace skills that are difficult to replace. Now, one of the consequences of our policies, or lack thereof, and I, you know, it's not the only one, but you've been reading about this lately, that we have an extraordinarily high poverty rate. In fact, the United States has the highest child poverty rate of any country in the world, developed country in the world, I must add. It's at 22%. Sweden, just for comparison, and I admit, if you live in Sweden, you pay higher taxes. Um, it is a socialist country. We probably will never be like Sweden, but for comparison purposes, Sweden has a child poverty rate of 3%. A woman from Sweden attended one of my lectures and said, we are embarrassed by our 3%. Well, I'll tell you, it's about time for the United States of America to become embarrassed about our 22%. What does that mean? What does that mean when we have a 22% poverty, child poverty rate? Well, you don't need to be, you don't need new research. 
we have all the evidence around us. We know that these children are more likely to be high school dropouts. We know that if you're a high school dropout, you're less likely to hold a steady job and be a contributor to society. So we actually have a self-interest. If we want somebody to pay our social security, we should be very interested that our children are well enough and skilled enough to hold a job so they can pay taxes, which pays our social security. But we don't necessarily think that way. And, you know, it's all, we're in a period, of course, of stating what you all know, where there's such a great divide, a great debate, probably more, more tense than I can remember, between what is the role of government and what is the role of the individual. And the Tea Party has heightened this debate to a level we have not seen recently. I'm sure it's occurred in past history, where there's a belief that you gotta pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And it has worked historically for many people, you know, including within my own family. And we have this great belief in American exceptionalism. We are the greatest, we don't need to change, we don't need to improve, because we are the best country in the world. And I buy some of that, you know. I was born in Switzerland and my mother and my brother and I came to the United States at the outbreak of World War II in 1940. And my mother believed in the American dream and we were, we were imbued with the sense of possibility in America. And I am grateful for that. So I still believe in upward mobility. I believe in the dream, but even the dream is getting harder to dream than it was in my time. But there's even in the last presidential campaign an accusation if you don't buy American exceptionalism hook, line, and sinker, you're unpatriotic. Where I suggest the greatest act of patriotism is to try to improve your country and make it better for all citizens. But we are not at that point at this time. You know, you don't have to be soft-hearted or liberal to espouse family-friendly, child-friendly policies. One of the most outspoken proponents, and he's been an advisor to President Obama on the question of early childhood education, is a Nobel Prize winning economist at the University of Chicago by the name of James Heckman. He's one of the biggest proponents of early childhood education. Not because he's soft-hearted or simply loves little children, which we all should do, but because he sees the numbers. He says the investment in early childhood education is the best investment any government can make. And governors are beginning to listen to James Heckman. Not Congress yet, but governors are. So it pays to invest. And I know politicians have said that forever, but it happens to be a truism. It costs to neglect. There is a huge cost. You know, we are exceptional in a number of interesting ways. We have the highest incarceration rate in the United States of America. We have the highest teen pregnancy rate in the United States of America. These are not exceptions that can be sustained and still keep America in the game of economic growth and prosperity. So one of the handicaps we have in achieving the change, which seems so common sense, we're not talking about extraordinary things. We're talking about things that are normal in most parts of the world. But one of the things is, is, the, is the idea that one, we can't afford it. Two, it probably won't work. It'll be a waste of money. And there's a third one, which I'll remember in a few minutes. <laughs> but 
you know, take an interesting example. I mean, people also lead isolated lives. I mean, one of the hardest things to explain in the course of recent events is the agriculture bill that is now in the House. I mean, the agriculture bill was extraordinarily generous, as it has been over the years, to wealthy farmers. Somebody came out with a report there were either 40 or 400 billionaires who are getting agricultural subsidies. Do they need it? At the same time, they have cut food stamps. And they say, well, we, we, have, we have a growth in food stamps because people are cheating. They're ripping off the system. Well, a detailed analysis of the system says no. They are not cheating. They're people who are hungry in the United States of America, here in Syracuse and Burlington, Vermont. And you know, the, the big divide, not only between parties, but between income gaps, between the extremely wealthy and the middle class and the poor, is larger than it's been since the Great Depression. So, but somehow, there is still an attitude that the poor are poor because it's their fault. Never mind the fact that the majority of Americans who receive food stamps are children and the elderly. They are not. They have not figured out how to rip the system. The problem is they don't participate in it enough, especially the elderly who have great pride about going to the government for help. So, we have to stop blaming the poor. I mean, the only way somebody could have voted against food stamps, I think, is by not seeing the faces, not seeing human beings behind these statistics. And, you know, with gated communities, with high salaries, with Congress people always raising money, which means they always associate with the wealthy. You know, you don't get many votes if you visit a, a lunch program in your local school and see what the difference that a free lunch, school lunch makes, which may be the only proper meal in many cases that a child receives. I did that once when I was Deputy Secretary of Education and they wanted to cut children's lunch programs. And this was in Philadelphia and the car kept going through neighborhood after neighborhood of hard decay. I mean, people, it could have been another world. It was, it was so depressing and the community was so down and out. And I got to the school and the school was the only place that seemed alive and intact. And when they handed out these lunches to the little first graders, I thought, could they take that away from them? I mean, if, if they went to a food bank and saw who goes, who goes, it's not you know, rip-off artists, it's families whose refrigerator is empty and whose shelves are bare. But we have forgotten how to humanize poverty and how to invest in opportunity because the best anti-poverty program is still a paycheck. The ability to support your family is what every American family wants. So how how do we move? Is there any, any hope? Can we get over this exceptionalism? Can we get over this individualism? Can we get over government is the problem, not the solution? It's not easy, but we cannot be discouraged. We cannot be paralyzed by what seems to be happening today. And I do take some hope from states, from state efforts. I do take some hope that within the Republican Party, there is now a public debate about the role of the Tea Party. Has the party gone too far in mean-spiritedness, in extremism? I think that's a healthy debate, and it may swing things more towards the center. I take heart in what is happening in some states. In my own state of Vermont, uh, we passed a law, a bill into law, 
last winter uh, that helps Paycheck Fairness Act. It's similar to the Federal Paycheck Fairness Act, which is lingering, languishing, dying, keeps getting worse the more I think about it, um, in Congress. And this, this law in Vermont does two interesting things. One, it says you can ask for workplace flexibility twice a year. The twice part was compromise. But you gotta time everything perfectly to make sure it's only twice a year, but at least you got it. And the, and the, and the key is you can ask for it without retribution. Sometimes when you ask for flexibility, they say, we'll give you flexibility, you're fired. You got all the flexibility you want. But with this law, you can't do that. The second thing it does, you know, it's sometimes small things that make a difference, at least which seem small to us. It says that you can talk about your salary. It's surprising how many people do not know that many companies have policies that say you may never disclose your salary, you may never ask somebody how much they make. Well, how do you know if you're paid fairly, if you don't know what the next person, at the next cubicle or the next machine is earning? And this was the key to the Lily Ledbetter case. She worked for 20 years on the factory floor of Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. And one day somebody sent her an anonymous letter. It had to be anonymous because he could get fired for saying this, which said, you've been earning less than the men who've been supervisors in the same job as yours for 20 years. She sued. She won in the lower court. She lost in the Supreme Court. As you know, it was finally fixed, but not completely. The only part that was fixed by legislation was the deadline she lost because you're supposed to file a discrimination suit for within 180 days of experiencing it. Of course, she didn't even know it. How could she have done so? And it's cumulative. You know, after 20 years, her pension is significantly lower. So this is not just pennies we're talking about. It's thousands of dollars. So in Vermont, you can now ask, and hopefully, that law will be effective. So the two best remedies are still equal pay and the ability to work, the ability to be both a caregiver and a provider and to be at the table. I would also suggest that we elect more women. And why? Because it does make a difference. I mean, again, Kirsten Gillibrand is an interesting example. You know, sexual assault in the military didn't happen last year for the first time. It's been going on since one cave man assaulted one cave woman, but she had no place to go while he was making paintings. But <laughs> she brought it out into the open. And so did the four other women on the Senate Armed Services Committee. Without those five women on that committee, we would still not know that in the past six months, the level of sexual assaults were the highest ever, higher than the previous six months. That report just came out yesterday. So the women tell their stories because some, obviously, we're very grateful that men support many of these issues. We wouldn't have anything happening if we didn't have male colleagues at our side. But there is still an intensity about things you've experienced. I don't believe there's a woman in this room who has not walked into a parking lot at night looking for her car and groping for her keys and feeling that sense of insecurity. It's something in your gut that you live with. Now a man can worry about that for his daughters, for his wife, for his partner, but it's still not quite the same thing. And intensity and perseverance matter in politics. 
We know that politics is competitive about who gets elected. It is also competitive about what gets on the agenda and where it gets on the agenda. Is it a footnote or is it at the top of the agenda? And as governor of the state of Vermont, I no doubt governed like all my male predecessors most of the time. But every once in a while, my life experience as a parent, as a wife, entered the arena. That's one reason I put a lot of money into childcare, because I saw this as an economic issue. If parents have good childcare, they can go to work and they can stay on the job. Put a lot of money into children's health care, which had a wonderful name and still does, of Dr. Dinosaur. So I had somewhat different priorities, not in everything, but maybe 5% of the time. But sometimes that 5% can be very, very important. We also had an interesting demonstration this month, the end of October, on how women might operate somewhat differently in how they govern. I found it significant that Susan Collins, Republican senator from Maine, came up with the idea about, hey, let's compromise <laughs> over the budget shutdown and the lifting the debt ceiling. And she came up with a proposal. And she got two other Republican friend colleagues to support her. You know, Lisa Murkowski from, Al from Alaska had a great quote in the time. She said, it's time to get real. It's time for common sense. Um, politics be damned. That took a little courage, you know, for those women to do that. Why, why didn't the men? Because they're scared to death that somebody will run to the right of them and that they will lose their seats. And they were blind to the damage they were causing themselves, both politically and to the people who were affected by the shutdown. So may not be scientific to draw a major conclusion from that, but anecdotes are useful too in drawing conclusions. The fact that women do talk to each other more, the women senators break bread together, they have lunch together every month or two, they sometimes work on bills together, the men are so keen on competitiveness and I won, you lost, that they don't eat in the Senate dining room together. I mean, that's sort of the foundation of collegial politics. You know, as a state legislator, I, I couldn't get anything done if I didn't talk to the opposition and work out compromises. So I think more women would help. I don't want to conclude that we have halos you know, I do remember somebody by the name of Michelle Bachman and Sarah Palin, um, but they're not the majority. You don't need 100% attendance from women on one issue to create a change. You just need enough to break, to tip the balance. And I am confident if we had more women, we would have affordable childcare, quality childcare. We would have workplace flexibility, we would have paid family leave. Well, let me conclude by asking the question, you know, what, what makes people say, I've had enough, I'm going to do something about this? Because what we really need is popular support to give the policymakers and lawmakers courage and the information that tells them, hey, there is a constituency that's larger than the Koch brothers, that's larger than the Tea Party. There is a constituency out there that supports paid family and medical leave. But we need your voices. I mean, what happened in New York City when the labor unions and children's groups and women's groups mobilized and they got paid sick days has to happen throughout the country. And people my age also have to acknowledge we have to fight some battles again, which we thought we had won forever, like access to contraception, like access to safe and legal abortion. 
We thought we had done that, not to worry, but we have to fight to keep what we have, and we have to fight also to get what we need in the future. What makes a person be an activist? Speak up, vote, write, demonstrate, whatever form it takes. Well, I'll give you a PowerPoint. I know you've been looking for one <laughs> all this time. But this PowerPoint, you have to do the work. It consists of three boxes. In the first box is something called anger. You have to be upset about something. You know, in my case, it was very simple. Um, it wasn't the only thing, but it's an example. Uh, my children had to uh, cross the railroad tracks on their way to school, and there were no lights, no guardrail, and I became a worried mother. The worried mother syndrome is quite powerful, actually, as an incentive to change. Uh, or it can be something big, like, why aren't we doing more about global climate change? But it's the kind of event that you turn off the remote, you unplug your ears, and you decide you're going to do something. The second box is something called imagination, that you give yourself the luxury of imagining change, what the world would look like, what my street would look like, what the railroad track would look like with flashing red lights, which I did eventually get, which was probably the most important thing because it gave me that important feedback loop that you can fight City Hall. If you do stick your neck out, something might happen. If you stay at home in a dark room with your hands folded like Whistler's mother, Nothing will happen. She never looked happy to me. <laughs> but anyway, you have to have imagination to, to visualize change. I put another ingredient in there, and that is empathy, which is severely lacking at the moment. All religions teach it. You are your brother's and sister's keeper. You learn how to walk in somebody else's shoes. But we've forgotten how important empathy is. Okay, first box, anger. Second box, imagination and empathy. The third box is probably the toughest of all, and that is optimism. And I know the students here may be wondering, you know, what's the future going to be like for me? Everything seems to be falling apart, and it's hard to find peace on earth, goodwill towards men and women. But Optimism is what we must retain because, you know, they say that pessimists are usually right. Those are the pessimists. Um, but optimists, and I believe it was Margaret Mead who said this, optimists change the world. You know, there's no guarantee if you stick your neck out that you're going to get what you ask for. You know, the young people who sat at drugstore counters during the civil rights movement and endangered their own lives, they did not know that those actions would tear down all of the signs in America that said blacks only and whites only. They took the risk. The people who came out early for the gay and lesbian rights movement did not know, and often they were endangered, and sometimes, in some places, still are today, they did not know that the President of the United States would one day come out and support same-sex marriage. They did not know that the day before yesterday, the United States Senate did pass a bill that bans discrimination against gay and lesbian and transgender Americans. Hopefully, the House will catch on. But you don't know when you're, in, when you're taking a risk. It is risky. It is risky sometimes to speak out at Thanksgiving dinner, where your parents may not agree with you, or your uncle thinks, what's, what's Syracuse University done to you? <laughs> um, so and it's hard to speak out publicly, where your face and your voice are known. But that is exactly 
what we have to do. We have to use this great democracy in the way it was intended. It was not intended to be run by the Koch brothers. It was not intended to be run by the richest people in America. It was intended to be run by us, by you. And we have an equal vote and an equal voice. So I ask you to keep up the good fight. And if you think you've done a lot, it isn't enough. We have to stay in the game. We have to make the United States of America an exceptional country in every sense of the word. The land of opportunity, the land that enabled me, daughter of a single mom, not speaking English, enabled me to make my contribution to this country. And that should be the same gift that we can give to every generation. Thank you. We'll hear from Christy Anderson, and then we'll hear from Sarah Prowley. Thanks. That was wonderful. Um, I just want to make two points or address two things that Governor Kunin uh, talked about. The first is the desirability of electing more women. And you gave us some very nice anecdotes, which I've used myself. Uh, Susan Collins and, and uh, Kirsten Gillibrand has certainly been wonderful in bringing our attention to uh, sexual uh, violence in the military. But there's actually now, from a political science point of view, been enough women elected to office at various levels that there is data about, uh, about the, the differences that women can make in office, as well as, as nice anecdotes. So uh, people have looked at, and I won't go into deep weeds here, but um, people have looked at uh, men and women in Congress, and even more, there's even more information about men and women in state legislatures, obviously. And uh, men, women are, do have different priorities, and I think you're absolutely correct that it's not only you want to look at, you know, kind of differences on a vote, but differences on agendas. And I think one of the ways that, that it's very clear that um, women, so, so women do vote differently. I mean, more women voted uh, to support the, uh, to, to have supported gun control and weapon, assault weapons bans and so forth. More women voted in Congress for the Family and Medical Leave Act. But also women have acted to expand congressional and state legislative agendas. So, uh, you know, one example is that up until Louise Slaughter and other uh, members of, women members of Congress got on the job research on cancer didn't really look at women's cancers. So they changed things so that um, funding and research included women and minorities in clinical trials, assured funding for breast cancer and uh, ovarian cancer and so forth. Um, women state legislators have moved issues like latchkey children, domestic violence, comparable worth and so on off the back burner and onto, um, onto potentially successful legislative uh, uh, action. Um, and it's worth noting also that when you survey, when people have surveyed, and this is largely uh, coming out of Rutgers, the Center for American Women in Politics, surveyed state legislators, both men and women, they feel uh, that their, their work would be improved if there were more men and women, if there were more women, rather, working with men in the legislatures that they, they feel like the priorities would be better, that uh, the, they'd have different points of view represented in the legislature, things would be better. Um, there are as well, and you mentioned this a little bit, um, interesting differences in kind of political practice and style um, between men and women, and this is, these are tendencies, not you know, absolute differences, and you mentioned the, the, the fact that women in the Senate this October were able to come together and and initiate compromise, they're able to talk to each other and so on. And, and a number of studies have found that women legislators spend more time uh, 
working with other people, they enjoy collaboration more, they, uh, women are more persistent in state legislatures. I found that very a very interesting piece of, uh, very interesting finding that when women introduce legislation that doesn't pass, they tend to reintroduce it and reintroduce it, work on it until it gets passed. Men, on the other hand, tend more often to just drop it. If it doesn't get passed, then they, go, they walk off. Um, but in general, I'd say, and, and I think the legislator surveys support this, it's good to have men and women, just like it's good to have young people and old people and black people and white people and immigrants and non-immigrants together working on whatever issues there are to work on. Um, so yes, I think having more women in office will, will get us uh, in this direction. The other thing I think is really interesting about what you argued in the book and what you to some extent talk about here is that language and framing matter so much to how, uh, how our policies get, what policies get, how policies get talked about and then which policies get enacted. And you, I don't think you said here, but I think you said in the book that uh, in the 60s and 70s, feminism and women's equality was issues having to do with that were talked about uh, as having to do with freeing women and giving, emancipating women, having women be able to realize their own potential. And you say, and I agree, that that's not gonna cut it anymore. That's not a way to successfully frame issues that you are talking about. Um, another way to do this, like family and medical leave and you know, increasing food stamp and uh, funding and, uh, and putting more money into early childhood education, which we have, I agree, all kinds of research telling us how beneficial that is. Another way to frame this is care for the vulnerable, empathy, caring for other people. We need to help people who can't, uh, you know, who don't have enough food, who are hungry. We need to help people, children who are maybe in bad schools and so on. This is, I think, in a, in a way, the Hillary Clinton quote, what takes a village to raise a child, you know, this is, so we all should cooperate. Well, I really, I worry about the efficacy of that type of frame because of the, the sort of American exceptionalist counter to that, that everybody's responsible for their own situation. I mean, we can be empathetic, but if there's all kinds of people around us saying, you don't really need to be empathetic to these people. They, they got where they are. You know, they, we don't have to help them because they need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps the way I did, say. So the, the, the kind of vulner, helping the vulnerable or empathy frame doesn't seem to me to be uh, working very well right now in our time of divided uh, government and the Tea Party and so on. And I do think then that the, the, a third option, which you also talk about, is the, what you might call the, the James Heckman uh, kind of way of framing things. That is that it is in our collective economic self-interest um, to invest in early childhood education and in family medical leave as two examples. And I think there is so much evidence on this basis evidence from hard-nosed economists like Heckman that one of the things we all need to do in addition to electing more women is to disseminate this information and really put this information into, uh, into forms that will convince people. Um, and so I, I think that you're so right in talking about how we, f that how we frame these issues is important and that's uh, something I don't know how to do it and I'm glad you're out there framing this <laughs> and talking about it. Um, but I would, I would like to add that to what you've said. So. Thank you. Well, again, thank you for being here. And um, thanks especially for writing this book, because I think the issues you address are so important. Um, particularly these, intra, these issues of work-life balance, which are very important right here in the academy. I just read a recent study that showed that rates of motherhood actually among women academics 
um, is significantly lower than rates of motherhood among um, comparable women, um, professional women, so CEOs, lawyers, even doctors. So clearly we have a lot of work left to do here in the academy about how to, you know, in confronting some of these work-life balances um, for families. Um, I just have sort of two quick responses too. Um, one is about politicizing the personal and the second is about unintended consequences of policies. So I think um, we might all agree that um, politicizing the personal has been sort of one of the central accomplishments of the women's movement. But it's probably fair to say too that this is an ongoing struggle. So how the question for me is sort of how do we encourage women to see work and family life issues like those that you speak about in your book as political issues that require collective action and public policies or institutional policies that we might see um, at the university. How do we encourage women and their allies, because you're right, we, we need to enlist allies, and we already have some, to pursue legal and policy remedies to instances of discrimination in the workplace and elsewhere. So some recent research I read is, um, looks at the experience of women academics, and I think it sheds light on some of um, the challenges involved in politicizing the personal, even for um, well-educated, very professional women. My feeling is if these hold true for um, very well-educated professional women, it's um, doubly true for women who are um, at jobs you know, more service type jobs, right, that have less sort of power. Um, so in a study of women faculty at the University of California, Irvine, um, researchers found that women in academia often perceive um, that they are victims of discrimination, just like in any other walk of life. Um, they not only understand that there's pay differences, um, documented pay differences, but they perceive more informal forms of discrimination and subtle and indirect forms of discrimination as well. However, they were as a whole rather sort of disenchanted with legal remedies, such as like changing formal university policies and rules, because they feared um, that they were gonna be subjected to sort of informal sanctions and ostracism. So as a result, the women opted for very less confrontational kinds of change. And some of these is what I might label sort of self-help remedies, like forming women's groups or um, informal mentoring or even formal mentoring relationships with um, other women. But um, in the words of some of the, research, the researchers, the women in some cases um, adapted their experience of inequality to an individual model of responsibility. So in other words, they didn't really frame their experience of discrimination in broader political terms as much as they deemed it as an individual problem that they had to solve on their own. So I think in addition to the issues that you and Christy talked about of, of a tendency in America to um, look towards, you know, sort of the individual responsibility frame, there's also a tendency to internalize that, right? Um, and so they found ways to cope, and I think we can, we're all familiar with this, right? Um, one, one woman who was interviewed described how she would take her kids to the park and rather than interact with them, she would grade papers. Um, another one said she managed the work-life balance by getting four hours of sleep a night. Um, so I think these kind of individual coping strategies actually really rang true for me. Um, I think I've done some of them myself. And oftentimes we even share these stories as kind of like old war stories, you know, and we're sort of proud of them. <laughs> um, and we're just happy we, when we get through it, right? And get through it meaning either the kids grow up or we get tenure or, or what have you, right? Um, and I think this tendency to turn towards these individual responsibility models is echoed in other parts of American society where many families' responses to the economic hardships of the last several years is to go into debt um, or to buy self-help books about how to better manage their finances. Um, indeed, there's like a whole industry around um, self-help personal finance, um, which I think is an indication of how easy it is to kind of depoliticize these um, personal, what could be seen as sort of personal issues. Um, and I do think it's a particularly American um, response, so it requires a lot of vigilance 
um, an effort to continue to frame these issues in political terms and encourage women and others to respond to them um, through policy. Um, of course, um, we do sometimes succeed, and I'm glad that you're an optimist, and I was actually thrilled to see the governor, Andrew Cuomo, He's introduced legislation called the Women's Equality Act, which is um, intended to end discrimination and inequality based on gender. And um, I don't think we're gonna have time, because I'd rather hear what you guys say, but there is a really fun commercial at, for this, um, for this Equality Act that's you know, funny, actually. And so it sort of injects some levity into what are some very serious issues. Um, if you wanna see it, at the end we can, we can do it. Um, my second point, just really quickly, is about the sort of unintended consequences of policies. Um, in pursuing a family-friendly policy agenda, whether it's the workplace or the legislature, legislature, we still need to think about potential unintended consequences. And I'm going to give an example, at the, again, at the university setting, since that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, many universities, including SU, have a parental leave policy, which provides um, a sort of work reduction for um, new parents. And on its face, and I think in most of the case in practice, this works very well and is a very good step forward. However, I think some universities have found that um, this policy actually provides an advantage to some men, um, particularly men who do, do not carry a lot of the responsibilities for childcare at their home. By giving them extra time to do research and writing, which makes their research um, even stronger, their tenure case even stronger. So a policy that's sort of intended to help women may actually kind of further their disadvantage. Now, I don't know what to do about that. Um, I don't know how, if there's a way to write those policies so that they don't, don't do that. But I think it's important to keep in mind that sort of um, treating men and women the same might not, might not always mean that you're treating them equally. So, so thank you. And I, Chris. Microphones that are going around. If you'd like to uh, ask a question, make a brief comment. There are the microphones going around. We'll get this gentleman down here in the front, Fred. Hi, I um, I I grew up in the '60s and and became a feminist, I guess, in the '70s and. Uh, uh, spent my career in the newspaper business and worked with uh, women and uh, male colleagues and uh, on women's, e I wrote editorials for many years and on women's issues, uh, one of my women colleagues once kind of implied that she was the one to take on that task and I kind of got in an argument with her saying that as a feminist I could argue for, for women's rights and gender equity as well as she. But, but hearing you today, I, I see there is more than a nuanced difference between feminist men in politics and women in politics. Um, and I guess my question is, uh, you, you mentioned, I was astounded to hear that, that we're one of only three, I guess, developed countries that... that any countries. Any countries. Any countries. Oh yeah, you mentioned Swaziland and... Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea. <laughs> astounding. My question goes to foreign policy, a kind of feminist foreign policy or a foreign policy directed by a government where women are definitely have the critical mass, should we say. Uh, there are a lot of countries, I mean, it, it makes us sound backward in terms of gender equity, but you know, there are countries where women are really victims of violence uh, around the world. I mean, I was just reading about Congo being the, the rape capital of the world right now. Uh, how would you see a, a feminist or a woman-led foreign policy differing from, from what we have today? And, and would, it be, would it need to be muscular and need to be in some way assertive or confrontational, if not aggressive? Well, you've got a lot of great questions. First of all, let me congratulate you for identifying yourself as a feminist. So does my husband, who is here, and my, uh, my book is... <laughs> Uh, and we need you, you know, um, it's, it, it's, uh, it's very important. Um, how would, it, you know, 
I think you saw a little bit of your answer in Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State. Um, she, she was like most Secretaries of State in almost all ways, except she created a special ambassadorship with Milan Revere for um, women's issues, gender issues, um, trying to address some of the violence issues and, and um, education restrictions around the world. And wherever she traveled, she would meet with women's groups. She made an effort of that. So I think she gave it, she gave it a, a, an extra push um, that previous male, well, of course, there were two previous female ambassadors. Uh, I don't think either Condi Rice, at least not noticeably, or Madeleine Albright did as much of it. I mean, she, in a way, wasn't breaking precedent in that sense. So she had a little more freedom, I think, also to push the women's issues. Um, and my hope is that, under Kerry, that those will stay in place, that, that it'll now become part of the normal way of doing foreign policy. Um, if she, you know, you can't make it your only issue. Um, just like an African American and Barack Obama can't make race his only issue. I mean, it doesn't work that way. Um, you've got to pay attention. You know, as governor, I had to pay attention to the nuclear power plant or railroads or you know everything on, uh, that was happening in my state and everything that's happening in the world. But you can sort of put daylight where there's been darkness. You know, just like the whole sexual assault issue. You can, you can. So many issues happen. We never know about, you know, we only know, you know, one-tenth of one percent of the news. I and mean, even now, we don't know much about what's happening in Darfur because it's sort of not as, not as exciting or terrible or whatever, and we're, we're lost in, in, in Syria. So, it's a long meandering answer. Um, I think, Simple, we all bring our life experiences into leadership, no matter who we are. Um, we may not be so conscious of it. So I think it's inevitable, and I hope to live to see the day when we have a female president, that that emphasis will become visible. But you did have Margaret Thatcher, which everybody always holds up. You know, women are different. Ha, ah, gotcha. Uh, because <laughs> Margaret Thatcher you know, it was a tough lady, the Iron Lady. Uh, I like to think that deep down, she must have had a little thrill that she was the first woman telling all these men off. But uh, she did nothing for women. She, did, she had one woman in her cabinet. She, she did nothing. But having said that, even though she was not a feminist in any sense, she was still a little role model for me somehow, you know, just seeing there, her there in this lineup um, influenced people like me to think, hey, she's there, three cheers. <laughs> I, I would assume that- Can you wait, I'm sorry, can you wait for the microphone just so that we, we get you on our file? I can usually be heard over Oh, but the, but the, 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 the file- Oh, record it, okay. I'm assuming the demise of the unions has also put women in odd positions because you can now, uh, you know, just discriminate however you want to. Yeah, the countries that have made the most progress also have the strongest unions. And New Jersey, for example, has paid family leave. The union movement is stronger there than it is in Vermont, or uh, I don't know enough about in New York. But the unions, as you know, have declined rapidly partly because um, industrial jobs have, have, have floated to other shores. But the new membership in unions is largely women. And I think it's going to be interesting as women get into leadership positions, and some are already there, that we go beyond fair wages and health benefits and include family-friendly benefits. Uh, so 
that really should be on the union agenda everywhere, but they're so fragile. Uh, but women are the new people, nurses, service workers, they're largely women. So the decline of unions would be even sharper if it weren't for the new women members. And uh, so I hope that that will give them a little boost, but it's, it's, it's not, the outlook isn't so great for unions. Hi, um, uh, and this may be a question for all three of you, but I'm kind of wondering about the economic framing of, um, of women's rights and egalitarian policies because I buy the data completely. I think it's absolutely true. But I wonder, first of all, if there were to be circumstances in which um, a society or a group of people were to be benefiting from somebody's subjugation, and it's happened before, uh, if that were to be the case, then it, it, this would no longer hold true, right? This would no longer be a good basis for policy changes um, and for social change. And it makes me think that although it's, it's a good sell, it's, it's a fragile basis on which to build an argument, and especially when there are you know, just justice-based arguments that, that really ought to, justice-based arguments that ought to hold the day, right? So it, I don't think it should have to be in anybody's economic interest um, for us, you know, as a society to treat women as equals. <laughs> I think that should be the reason that we do this. Um, well, you have a very good point, and I should let you all answer, but yeah, that should be the foundation, absolutely. That it's only justice, it's only, um, and yeah, we tend, to forget that as we get all excited about the economic argument. It's just that the economic argument may attract a larger constituency, and it is a fact. I mean, it is data-based. Um, that underneath it, yeah, we're not only talking about economic justice, we're talking about social justice. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you, Elizabeth, but I think, I mean, my point, I guess, was that the justice argument, and I didn't phrase it as nicely as you did, is not, has not been very effective in a lot of cases. And so these, the, the evidence-based <laughs> kind of economic arguments may win the day with some people. I mean, help. I mean, I don't, I don't see them as mutually exclusive, I guess. I, I mean, I, I share some trepidation. I'm sort of ambivalent about economic frames because this comes up a lot in environmental policy too, where I have more experience. and. Um, you know, a lot of environmental policies make economic sense, you know, from like a cost-benefit analysis, but that doesn't necessarily make it easier to pass them because in the short term, there's real economic losers and winners, right? So, I, so one thing it also ignores is the fact that, yeah, it's, a, it's really economically rational for society writ large to invest in these things, but there's real players like businesses who are gonna have to spend some money that they don't wanna spend, right? And so, so that's why they're sort of not automatic. Like, they don't automatically lead to policy change just because it's like, oh, it's in our rational self-interest to do this. As a society, it is. But the policy actually creates new winners and losers. And, right. and you know, one like, of the things that this raises is the kind of short-term versus long-term yeah. considerations. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah, we don't want to raise our taxes right now to pay for a preschool, that's a short-term way of looking at it, and we might argue, and James Heckman might argue, that you need to look on a more long-term right. level, right. and you know, that yes, 15 years down the line, 20 years down the line, those kids are not gonna be in jail, and when it's not gonna be costing, they're gonna be paying back into the taxes, but people are very, are not really able or willing to do that, I think. Yeah. I think yeah. the economic argument also is so attractive because that's what the naysayers have been saying. They say, we can't afford this, yeah, and we can say, yeah, hey, listen, you, you should afford this because yeah. it's going to cost you so much yeah. more. Right. So that's, you know, we get caught in that rhetoric. We have time for a couple, couple more there's quick questions, and there's one right here. Peggy, go ahead, and then we'll get one. This is just a comment more than a question. Thank you so much for your very interesting uh, talk. I just wanted to add to your three box PowerPoint, uh, if I could. Um, the first box was anger, as I recall, and I'd simply like to point out that um, one of my favorite lines from another feminist activist, uh, Sister Teresa Kane, who spoke truth to power with the Pope, pointed out in a, in a famous speech she gave about 20 years ago 
that the uh, second syllable of courage is rage. And so uh, I simply just wanted to make that point. I have no question. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's hard to frame the question. I guess when I look at all these issues, uh, I want my democracy back. And Citizens United has given the Koch brothers and people like them extraordinary power over women and over individual men and the genders, both of whom would seek the things that you are after. So to me as a citizen, maybe one of the best things we can do is not have the best government money can buy, but the best government of the people, by the people, and for the people when this is overturned, even by constitutional amendment, if it need to be. At your level, in one state, like in Vermont, I'm wondering, I've been reading this month's issue of The Progressive, published in Madison, and there's a very interesting article about ALEC, and I forget exactly what ALEC, uh, it's a, a state. Legislative Exchange yeah, Council. American Legislative Exchange, Council. what is it? Council. So at each state level, this ALEC thing functions a lot of times secretively, but you know, these people are not exactly of the people, by the people, and for the people. And in fact, a person in this magazine penetrated that thing. And one person offhandedly said, what we need is more rich people. And so what's been interesting about the shutdown of the government is now businesses looking at the Republican Party saying, you know what, maybe we need to break with a Tea Party because this economy lost $24 billion. So just whatever your comments are about Citizens United, lobbying for that, overturning it, constitutional convention if we need to, because I'm an angry citizen that wants my government back, but also as a state legislator and governor and so on, what, what even the ALEC thing maybe looked like in Vermont. Governor, to give people context, can I just ask you, what did you spend, do you, do you remember what you spent on your first election to the state legislature? Oh my goodness. Well, this is Vermont, and this is 1972, so you know, it was another era, another cosmos. Um, but uh, I think you know, we, well, you, know, you get elected in Vermont to the legislature by door knocking. You go door to door, you introduce yourself, you carry dog biscuits, um, <laughs> and um, that's how you get elected. I, we had one wine and cheese party to raise, at that time it was Chablis and Brie, which tells you it's a little dated, um, but it cost like $350, which was crazy. But um, for governor, you know, it's a small state. We're like 550,000 population, but the media is so expensive. I, in my life, I'm trying to remember. I think I've got denial um, <laughs> taking over, but it, it was about $800,000. Um, but a congressional race in Vermont costs more, um, and a, um, a Senate seat costs more because it comes a national campaign with outside interests on both sides contributing. So I'm sure. Uh, Pat Leahy spent between three and five million uh, on his campaign, and Bernie Sanders as well. So, but I agree with you completely. Money is the evil, uh, and my husband is involved, and I'm peripherally involved in Americans for Campaign Reform, which is one of the organizations trying to uh, have more government funding for elections. Um, but yes, yeah, Citizens United was a terrible decision. Um, and I'm not sure we can fix it. And the Supreme Court is now taking up another campaign uh, law about the cumulative money that individuals can give. And chances are very great they'll strike that down. So I don't know what the answer is, but it, it may be that you know, the little blip, little blip of hope, um, there was a community, I can't remember which state, a small community where the Koch brothers Coral, knew stra- Coralville, Iowa. Coralville, Iowa, thank you. <laughs> where the Koch brothers, you know, said, hey, great idea, we're gonna 
we're going to get involved in local elections. So they poured tons of money into this little city council race, population, what, 5,000 or something of the community, and they rebelled. All the candidates they backed lost. So maybe that's what's going to happen. We're going to say, enough already. We're not going to listen to you. Well, Governor, I want to thank you for a powerful presentation, and Christy, Sarah, thanks too. And we'll now go out and continue the conversation outside over some food and drink. So thank you very much. Thank you.